Okay, um, thanks so much for inviting me today to um, talk about my favorite topic, which is cancer survivorship. And um, I'm not sure I've ever followed a talk that talked about alligator, so um, this is a first today. Um, so I have the privilege of, of having a longer history in cancer survivorship, but the last two years or so, I have focused exclusively on net cancer survivorship. And I'm hoping today I can convince you why it's really important. Okay, so what I'd like to do is kind of help you understand what survivorship is. Um, this is a relatively new um, kind of niche in uh, oncology and um, can explain that. I also want to talk to you about the Cancer Treatment Summary and Survivorship Care Plan. This is a document that is the hallmark of um, cancer survivorship and what, what that looks like, how you can get one. Um, some common symptoms for net survivors. Um, and if we have time, uh, I'll go over kind of management of some of the key ones. And then finally, navigating and optimizing um, your survivorship care. Okay, let's start off. Who are cancer survivors? Believe it or not, this is, yes, I got a hand raised. Um, believe it or not, this is, um, this is kind of, the definition of a cancer survivor is um, kind of uh, different for different people. This is the definition I choose to use. Anyone who's been diagnosed with cancer from the time of diagnosis through the balance of his or her life. Um, I think historically, uh, survivorship was when you were done with active treatment, and then from there, what, what to do about the late and long-term effects. Um, I think now, as we have more, let's say, chronic type of cancers um, and treatments doing so well that we're prolonging life, that this is now about kind of from the start of diagnosis throughout, throughout your, your, uh, the rest of your life. So survivorship is just simply supporting these unique needs as survivors living with, through, and beyond cancer. Now, really quickly, just going back, cancer survivorship started in about 2006 with the Institute of Medicine identifying there was this gap when patients were done with treatment. It's kind of like we, we said, okay, you're done, head out, and, and then we had no plan. So our, the goals were to do uh, a treatment summary and care plan so that a patient was empowered with what, what they had done, what their diagnosis was, and be able to uh, bring that back to their local docs, their local community. And then we needed to do a better job about coordinating the care from where you received your oncology care back to um, between the specialist and, and your primary care. And then we needed to make sure we did prevention, surveillance, and detection of new and recurrent cancers, um, as well as the consequences of the cancer and their, their treatment. So this is kind of where it started. Now, I'm fortunate in, to have my own little net survivorship clinic where I get to spend a, a lovely amount of time with patients and really talk to patients and kind of go over this. But I really do feel if you don't have access to this, that you can put, put this together, kind of piecemeal this together for yourself. So let me go over how I kind of structure my visit and, and help you kind of um, piece this together for yourselves. I start with symptom assessments, and this is really just what is going on right now. And when I talk about symptoms, which I will in, in a little bit, I don't mean just physical symptoms. I mean, what are your symptoms and issues going on now? This can be work, this can be insurance, this can be kind of whatever in your world is going on right now because of your cancer and cancer treatment. I, um, I review these, um, they're on a scale of zero to five. If I have returning visits, um, I do this same form again, and it's kind of fun to track. Um, oftentimes, I don't even see the same things again, which, which kind of leads to how dynamic this process is, right? In six months, you have different concerns. Um, so, and then after, we address those and give uh, ideas for management and kind of tips and how we can work on that. I'll present the, tr the survivorship treatment summary and care plan, which is this document in the middle. Um, I put this together, and kind of in the survivorship world, this is a very difficult document to kind of to, to get together uh, pr pr 
produce and disseminate. So there's a lot of um, talk about how do we do these, how do we do these efficiently, um, and it, it's really quite time consuming. I do them for my patients, but we're working on different ways to get patients empowered to do their own. So I've, I've actually just started doing patient workshops where we um, are getting together and kind of as, as almost like a support group doing them together ourselves. Um, and then what I do after I have all this information is I create a care plan, which essentially is with your cancer diagnosis and your cancer treatment, what are the late and long-term implications that we're looking out for? And how do we manage those? And who's gonna do that? So let's say you're on a somatostatin analog. What are we gonna do about that? Who's gonna monitor your thyroid once a year? Who's going to monitor your blood sugars? Who's going to, you know, we have to look at all of those different things. So the care plan is just to, uh, to write out what we're looking for and who's gonna follow it. And then um, finally, the last part, I give resources. Now this varies depending on your region. I, of course, give resources around our, um, in our area, whether that's um, exercise, supportive services that we have, support groups that are around, um, therapists that I, that, I, that I know are in our region, various resources, whatever is needed. Sometimes it's national resources or I can uh, connect patients with national organizations to kind of help whatever their needs are. And then actually there's one last part about my visit, and that is I work with the um, patient to develop a healing plan. And it's actually just health goals that we're gonna focus on short term, like in three months, um, to kind of keep progress, forward progress going. And I'm gonna show you that in a, in a bit. Okay, so common symptoms. I'm sure you are all familiar with these. Um, fatigue and muscle weakness, diarrhea, abdominal pain, sleep disturbance. This could either be sleep onset or sleep maintenance, meaning you have trouble staying asleep. Flushing, uh, vitamin deficiencies, poor absorption of nutrients, and hyperglycemia. Uh, these are all physical symptoms. And so what I wanna do is contrast this slide with this slide. And I, if, if I, say, I always say this, if you remember anything from my talk today, I want you to know that anything from your cancer diagnosis or cancer treatment that is now different in your world is a survivorship issue. It does not have to be only physical symptoms. This, so this can be employment concerns, your fear of uncertainty or, or living with uncertainty now. Um, patients will tell me, I feel like I live in three month blocks, right, until my next scan, or six month blocks until I get my next scan. So how am I supposed to plan for retirement when this is how I live? These are real issues. These are real issues. Um, relationships with others, this can impact your relationship with your children, your spouse, your caregiver. Um, you know, we were talking earlier, you are more than just a patient. Your world is relationships with all kinds of people and you do all kinds of things and your cancer and cancer diagnosis impacts all of those. Cognitive impairment, um, this can be a result of treatment, it can be a result of just psychological stress, stressors dealing with this. Um, so worthy of recognizing and if it becomes um, kind of a more of a concern or limiting your daily activities, we need to address that, maybe do some testing um, and find different ways to, to help that. Financial concerns is a huge one. Uh, we have financial counselors to help, but I think this is one of the differences when I've, when I've done historic little treatment when, when patients are done with active treatment versus chronic cancer, or, you know, net being an indolent cancer, the financial burden is very different when you're talking about long-term over decades versus an acute period of time where maybe you had medical expenses at that time that were significant versus this is now, this is now part of your world, right? Anxiety and depression, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, worry about the impact on their children. So many parents uh, not only 
worry about how their disease is and how their ability to kind of function day to day is gonna impact their children, but also the genetics part of that. I mean, there's a lot of concerns. Nutrition and dietary concerns. Um, thank you for the great talk. Um, we have a net dietitian, um, so very similar to you. It's, it's great that they're connected with a nutritionist who really understands uh, carcinoid syndrome. Um, so so well-meaning information can sometimes be misunderstood and then and, and given the wrong information. So, And my last one here about trust is a, is a personal uh, uh, insight that I've started to recognize and I'm hoping during our patient caregiver panel we can discuss a little bit more. Um, I've noticed since working with net patients that this theme of trust keeps coming up. And I'm not sure where, it's, uh, where it originates from, but I'm really, really fascinated about it. Um, my initial thoughts were like, is it because it took so long from diagnosis to get to your diagnosis, or is it because it's a rare cancer, or um, it's, there's just so many reasons why it could be. So if you could help me figure that out, that'd be great. So this is how I look at survivorship. Um, there are many, many issues, and we, we overlap all of it. So I kind of view survivorship as a quality of life uh, model. And in terms of what we know specifically about NETS, um, we've had this, I think we've alluded to this earlier today, the, um, this global study was done um, in 2014. I, I think this is really, um, if, this is obviously just a couple of the pieces of information that, that were pulled out, but I think this really talks to how uh, pervasive symptoms are and how this is, impacts patients for NETS. So 92% of patients asked said that they had made a lifestyle change because of their NET. 60% were effective uh, by their emotional health. 58% worry about uncertainty. And 43 said it affected their ability to participate in their social life. And then 61% weren't working at the time. And 82% of the 61%, it was due to their nets. So this is a significant impact, um, both economically, emotionally, um, for, for patients. And then we had, from that study, we pulled out um, what was United States specific. So this year we just came out, kind of took that data and, and applied it to the United States and with symptoms, 90, uh, excuse me, 89% said they had net related symptoms. And these were often and um, on a daily or consistent basis. So this wasn't um, kind of an acute episode and then resolved. These, these are consistent. And the most common um, fatigue, diarrhea, abdominal pain and flushing. 74% said it had a negative impact um, on their lives, either a large or moderate amount. And this uh, was by uh, energy levels, finances, and emotional health. So large percentages. 94% had made lifestyle changes, um, either dietary changes or um, increased spending on travel. We know that a lot of patients travel to centers of excellence to get their care and how much this really creates a burden for them um, getting their care. And um, also having to cut back on physical activity. Um, sometimes I talk with patients who have so many diarrhea episodes that it's, um, it's hard for them to even go for a walk around the block, right? So this is quite impactful. And then work, 42% were currently working, but of those 42%, 62% needed days off, 30% asked for working accommodations, 21% needed to reduce their hours, 16% stopped altogether for a period of time, um, and of those not working, almost 80% of those said it was net related. So this, this is a huge economic uh, impact. Um, I don't know about time. I'll briefly go through these. Um, I wanted to talk to you about some of the most common symptoms that we have. One is um, fatigue. Actually, fatigue is the most common uh, symptom of all in all cancer survivors. 
And it is, the, the top is the, the, diagno or the definition of fatigue, which is a persistent feeling of physical, emotional, or mental exhaustion related to cancer or its treatment. And I think this is really important to recognize because sometimes patients just feel like, oh, I'm just tired, I'm tired. It's more than being tired, right? It's the mental um, and emotional exhaustion as well. And then fatigue often accompanies like almost all, all types of uh, issues in survivorship kind of all inter interplay with each other. So fatigue leads to mood disorders, sleep disturbances, um, pain, they're kind of all interwoven. And there's many, many causes of uh, fatigue. So up to 60 to 90% of cancer survivors experience fatigue. And research has shown that cancer-related fatigue is more debilitating and complex than fatigue just due to lack of sleep or exhaustion. So this is a different kind of fatigue. And um, I think that's really important to know. And then patients always want to say, well, when is it going to be, <laughs> when is it going to be over? When am I going to? It's really variable from patient to patient and um, other issues that you're dealing with. So how do we manage fatigue? Um, if you're really struggling with fatigue, I know it's, it's like sleep begets sleep. So um, too much sleep might not be too, too good. So seven to eight hours per night and avoid taking naps that last longer than 30 minutes. Probably the most data that we have is actually increasing physical activity as to combat fatigue. So recommendations are 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity as tolerated, or at least 75 of vigorous physical activity per week, and then muscle strengthening um, at least twice a week. Now, that seems like a lot, um, <laughs> but that's what we're shooting for. So we're gonna talk about that in just a bit. Um, pace yourself, delegate. I think patients need to understand your kind of your cycle of energy and not overbooking too much on a, in a specific day or you know that you always have more energy in the morning or maybe it's in the afternoon. Really trying to plan things that kind of go in flow with your, your energy time of the day. Reducing stress, anxiety, and depression. And of course, healthy diet and staying well, well hydrated. Sleeping issues, this is another big one in our clinic. Um, either falling asleep or staying asleep. Um, and it's really um, individualized, which is the theme of the day, right? Most people experience sleep problems at some point in your life, but it is really, really common for cancer patients. Um, lack of sleep can cause fatigue and impact your mood, your energy level, and concentration. And so we also need to look at new, new meds can interfere with this, physical symptoms, pain is um, quite significant, and, and worrying, ruminating, waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to sleep because you're just thinking, thinking, thinking. So how do we manage these? The first thing to do is rule out medical causes for this. There's other reasons why, obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg, other kinds of things, medications, those need to be ruled out first. Um, and then you really need to look at your sleep patterns and your habits, so, um, and your sleep environment. Um, I had a patient, actually just about two weeks ago, telling me about her setup before she goes to bed with the light and the, she wears a special light so she doesn't bother her husband and has, has her stack of books. And I said, You've, you're prepping to read, not prepping to sleep, right? So we have to make sure <laughs> our environment is reflecting what, what we want it to, to do. Um, use sleep medication um, with caution. Uh, I think there's a good place for sleep medication. Um, but it's often habit-forming and can be addictive. Um, there's usually non-pharmacological interventions that we can do first. Um, behavioral interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy can be really helpful. And social support can relieve worries. So good sleep hygiene, regular exercise, not at night, um, morning or afternoon, best. Um, reduce your exposure to bright light so that the last picture we had with your, your iPhone and your laptop and the TV and all of that is probably not a great idea. No heavy, heavy meals before you go to bed or, and limit your, your water intake. Um, and keep the bed for sleep and sex. So if you're 
If you're going to bed thinking you're going to be up and you've got books and you're doing other kinds of things, we create that pattern in habit. So really just limiting um, your bedroom for sleep and sex. Maintain a regular sleep, uh, sleep schedule. Cut back on caffeine, alcohol, and a bedtime ritual. I, I kind of feel like it's like when we were kids, right? Take a bath, <laughs> listen to sweet music, and um, we should probably learn more from them. Um, let me talk about physical activity. This can do so much for you, building your strength, endurance, re reducing um, anxiety, depression, uh, maintaining a healthy weight, and improving self-esteem. Any activity is better than no activity. So, you know, we are shooting for the 150 minutes. Um, really, activity, just getting up, doing dishes, walking around the house is, is better than s sitting down. So we're just, we, tr we slowly want to increase that. Strength training is really good. We know that we lose a lot of muscle mass. Cancer survivors have a lot of muscle mass loss, and we uh, want to work on that. And then just because you can't get up and do the big hour-long workout at the gym doesn't mean you get out of it. Um, <laughs> it's actually shown that shorter intervals produce the same benefits. So if you can exercise for 10 minutes um, in, in little segments, it's, um, it's just as helpful. Start slow and, and build, your, build your way up. I often think it's to get a buddy involved too, so have someone to hold you accountable for. All right, so this comes to like developing uh, your healing plan, and this is um, this is kind of what we do at the end of the visit. So depending on the different uh, issues that you're working on or concerned about, we identify what an intention is, and we determine specific actions that we want to take. This is being realistic, so when patients say, yes, I'll exercise every day, I'll hit that 150 minute mark, it's, it's if you haven't exercised in five years, that's not probably realistic, we're gonna start slow, right? Um, and then we always want a time frame to, um, to reassess, and we can change and alter, the point is making forward progress. So for example, um, this one says, I want to focus my healing efforts on physical healing and connecting with others to get the support I need. So my intention is to manage my pain and the actions that I would do would be able to get a referral from my primary care provider to a pain specialist, and then maybe you want to try acupuncture. And then your next intention might be to make peace with my losses, and we would, we would outline specific actions to take, so joining a support group, starting a grief journal, referral to a counselor. So you, just, so you kind of see how that works. And then typically we use three, three months um, to review uh, and kind of redo another plan or make adjustments. So in terms of navigating your survivorship, here's, here's, some, here's some things. Uh, Obtaining a treatment summary and care plan. If you do not have access to, to some place to, to get one, you can go online. There's a Journey Forward. There's Oncolink. Um, I believe the Live Strong Foundation has one. Um, or you can just, you can do one yourself. You can write down your diagnosis and your pathology and um, your treatments that you've had, right? You can do this yourself. If you feel like your visits um, aren't long enough, and, and I, f I feel like that, and sometimes I have an hour visit, so <laughs> um, you can always ask to have a specific appointment to address your symptoms, right? Um, so that would be helpful. Have a plan for monitoring your health. I think when you have control over the next steps that you're going to do, um, this can be really helpful. So the plan in and of itself is very reassuring and, and gives a lot of control back to the patient. Uh, un unfortunately, you will need to coordinate your care through multiple providers. One provider isn't going to meet the needs of, of everything that you need. So um, this, this, can ta this takes quite a bit of time, and I often have patients ask their caregivers to help in this. And then ask for referrals if you need something. And I wanted, to, I wanted to list several of really common referrals that I do from my clinic, just so that you understand the um, kind of the breadth of what we do. Uh, health providers, nutrition, 
physical therapy, exercise consultations. We can get, you know, you can help design a, an exercise program for you. Um, genetics, acupuncture, massage, neurocognitive testing, pelvic floor clinic, um, palliative medicine, and pain clinic. So if your needs aren't being addressed, just ask, ask. And so to optimize your survivorship, um, recognize that along the way, as you start different treatments and um, at different points, you'll need time just to heal and you can't, you can't do things. Uh, maybe at the pace that you want to, give yourself some time to process and heal. And that's the same for your, your caregivers as well. And oftentimes you're not congruent with your caregiver. So recognize that you're both on the same path, but oftentimes not in the same spot, okay? Develop a healing plan, take ownership of this. We want to be your team. So this takes, this takes part of responsibility on your behalf to kind of identify what you need and get what you need to. Ask for what you need. Um, proper amount of sleep, exercise, and nutrition. Attend outreach events like you're doing today. Um, get educated. Um, participate in research. All these great things we've heard about today. Connect with others. Support groups are a great source, either online or in person. Include your caregivers. I need to do a talk sometime on just caregivers. Um, and then advocate for yourself. Speak up. Um, because this is, this is my favorite slide when I think about survivorship. I feel like I see patients all the time and there's just so much more going on beneath the surface. And, and we don't know, sometimes we don't know the questions to ask you. So I really want to empower you to ask questions for yourself. All right. Um, thank you very much. Happy to answer questions.